I want to introduce my co-host with me, Linda Willard, who is also a member of the Breeders Education Committee. So, Hello. Linda, how are you? <laughs> Doing great. How's everybody out there? We're glad you're here to join us for these wonderful ladies. And Absol absolutely. We're, we are excited to have an amazing uh, uh, couple of... Uh, of segments, uh, we've been we had our first webinar with the Breeders Education Committee. Huge success! Um, I know you guys got a lot of feedback, and we're doing it again. Exactly. Only more so this time because we have a million questions, and we don't <laughs> to get worried. Those of you who sent questions, if we don't get to all of them, because there were so many that we kind of had to work with a list. So we would cover the same things with these three breeders that we covered with the last three breeders. So there would be consistency in the knowledge going forward. And I would like to read a, just a statement that was prepared by the committee. I'm just gonna read it. So it's not gonna be all that exciting, but I'm gonna read it excitingly. So here we go. During these webinars from the Breeder Education Committee, we hope to find out from the breeder panelists what they feel their path to success was. Was it breeding pr principles, research of pedigrees, or was it just plain luck? At least we think in the beginning, sometimes it's just plain luck. We believe successful breeders do have a plan for what they want to accomplish and produce. And in most cases, if you compare different breeders, those plans are oddly similar. Where do they think they are now? And that's something we will ask all of you today. So it may be that if some of our newer breeders were to follow the examples put forth by our panelists, they might find similar paths to success. For the rest of us, we're always still learning and we hope you enjoy this peek into our panelist breeding programs. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, a lot of you probably recognize some of the faces that are with us today. These ladies are amazing. Uh, you have seen them not only outside the ring, but you have probably seen them inside the ring, um, whether you're competing against them or you're cheering them on, which you can all raise your hands for both of those. And most importantly, that you know that we have um, just a, a combination of talent, experience, and most importantly, knowledge. So ladies, I'm gonna let you do a brief introduction of yourselves before we jump into some questions real quick. So Karen, how are you? Good, good okay. evening. I'm delighted to be here. We are delighted, we are delighted to have you. For those who, who might not know, we have a lot of newbies that join us. Tell us a little bit um, in a cliff note version, I guess, not to, not to take away from any of your success, just a little background so we can get a snippet of what we can look forward to. You got it. Um, I have been a golden retriever lover uh, for my pretty much my entire life as my mother was a very wonderful breeder of golden retrievers. So I've been involved about 50 years, starting as a junior handler um, and have uh, kind of split my time in golden retrievers as a breeder, but also as a handler. So there were many clients involved. There were many wonderful dogs that I've had my hands on that became a part of my own breeding program, which is kind of where I am today. I have a, a culmination of some very great dogs from an, from, uh, an old pedigree that um, I enjoy consistency with my line today. That's awesome, that's awesome. Rhonda, tell mm. us. What can, what can we look, what can we, those of us who, who know you, um, you know, obviously we know that you, you do have a judging license as well, but um, uh, inside the ring, but, uh, you know, just listening um, to your um, uh, intros that we had before um, with Karen and Yvonne and Rhonda, um, you guys are all amazing folks. Give us a little background. 
Well, let me make a quick correction because after I gave that little intro where I said I produced about 60 champions, uh, Kathy told me, no, it's over 70. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll make that quick correction. Um, and um, started in the early 70s, um, just enjoyed you know, the showing and confirmation. And over time, you build your friendships through show people. So it's sort of like going out for the weekend with your friends. <laughs> and, um, and in uh, that was primarily the first half of my years in dogs. And there's sort of a dividing line because even though I continued to show and breed, my focus shifted um, to uh, health research more toward the last half. That, that's, it's a, it's a really fun um, kind of segue into, into you know, how you started here. And we were talking a little bit about um, you know, things um, that have got us interested in before. So for all of you joining, there is a little meeting before the meeting. Um, just so you guys know, but um, we were talking about how a lot of us got involved in obedience first, and that kind of leads me to you, Yvonne. Um, you have an amazing record with your dogs, a long history. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, how I all um, began was I had a giant schnauzer, so we figured he was a big dog and needed the obedience, and that was the beginning, and I was um, fortunate to train with Bernie Brown. Um, and I grew up with a lot of, I grew up on farms. So I was always around animals and I um, had horses and he, he thought I had a natural knack for it. So he twisted my arm um, to have a golden retriever out of his champion, obedience trial champion, um, uh, dusters, I mean, metal ponds, dust commander. Mm -hmm. And that female that I had the pick female and she was the beginning that led me down this road. And what a, what a thrill it has been to, um, to compete and, and see all the, all the wonderful handlers, um, obedience competition. I mean, it's taken me all over the country and never would I have expected to, to end up here. This is an honor to be on this panel. Um, well, so thank I, you. I, can, I know well enough that I know you won't, you're, you're not a, 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 a lady that will definitely say some stats for you, but can you tell me how many um, arches you've got on dogs before? On, on my own dogs? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a I pretty- mean, dogs that I've shown myself or have bred? Um, Both. Okay, I'm, I believe I'm over 90 obedience trial champions. And, um, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Probably seven of my own dogs are arch dogs. That's but amazing. Breeding, I mean, breeding does get in the way of, of showing. <laughs> um, as yeah. I think everybody knows. Um, so I, a lot of my dogs are started maybe not until they're four or five years old. Wow. And when I think about what they could have done if they would have started earlier. No, when you is, they, they started, you're talking about your starting obedience or you're starting yes. breeding? Okay, started, you start started to um, compete. Okay. And, but many of those dogs have gone until they were 12. Or, hmm. I mean, and not just because I wanted to, I mean, they enjoyed it. And it mm -hmm. was like, they just weren't ready to quit. So absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, that, that's amazing. That really is. And Yvonne's brought up a good point. She, listen, I didn't lead her into this. You guys have all heard me here, but how did you acquire your first golden? She told us already. So I'm going to flip it back to Rhonda and, and ask her that question. Uh, well, my first golden was um, from a newspaper ad. <laughs> <laughs> my $75 dog that was my first personal dog, although several other dogs had been in my family. Mm -hmm. And I was given strict instructions that she had to be trained 
<laughs> that was my job. So um, I started training and um, went into obedience showing with her. And she got quite a few high end trials. And um, at shows, I then was watching the confirmation ring and wanted to try that as well. Awesome. And Karen, I mean, I know that you um, have been in dogs your whole life, pretty much um, uh, as a second generation, I'm right there with you uh, as yep. a third generation in it. It's amazing. But, uh, you know, you're, you know, you've had a lot of dogs, but your dog, like we've all had our first, like what some of us call it our heart dog or something like that. But um, how did that come about? Well, interesting. My, my personal first golden was a female that would have never made it in the show ring but she was my junior's dog. And her and I were a really excellent, wonderful team. And unfortunately, something that maybe it was best I learned early on, she developed epilepsy. Mm. And so obviously her career, as far as going to shows was ended. Um, I guess my next golden after that was part of a very famous family. And she was Wochika's Okeechobee Jake's sister. Huh. And this was my female that after the first junior dog broke my heart, I picked this puppy up out of the whelping box and she was Wochika's wind song. Who mm. this day, uh, I believe still is the only one to retire the best of opposite trophy for wow. I believe the Eastern Regional. And that's it's amazing. It's been one since that. And that's what started uh, after that. I wasn't even interested in juniors. Best <laughs> happened to be a beautiful, beautiful female. And that put me right into the confirmation ring, uh, finishing my first champion at 12. That's awesome. Um, that, so that was great. the one that that really started everything about uh, the look I wanted, the temperament I wanted um, to continue with. Yeah, I mean, we all we all start somewhere, and um, you know, we we have that that kind of gateway golden that brings us in, and we and we start this long journey. And I don't say that to talk about age. We're not in, we're not into that kind of stuff at all, yeah, but please. more or less this long journey with our dogs and the experiences. And, and, you know, I, I'm going to throw it out there. You know, why did you decide to start breeding goldens? You know, did you have a goal? Um, what did you want to do, you know, with the, your first litter? You know, did you have a hole in mind? Like you were going to start a breeding program or you were just like, you know, um, you're just going to have puppies. And I know a lot of us came from different, you know, kind of uh, starting points. But Karen, uh, you know, um, why did you, you know, be, decide to become such an active participant? I mean, I know, like we, we talked about, you had a breeding program kind of established, but then you decided to, to carry it on. Correct. And I was going to add one thing to that, Karen. It's, it's a two part. Um, who do you think your most consequential dog has been during your lifetime of breeding? Consequential to in in what? Well, facet? that's up to you, dear. <laughs> oh, she's tough. She's a tough co-host. I know. Um, <laughs> let me let me go back to your first original as far as why a breeding program became important to me. And in all honesty, it's because of having a competition with my mother. We started <laughs> liking a kind of a different look mm -hmm. and if i i wanted to prove myself that my look could be just as um wonderful as the look that she was going for Fair so enough. that's kind and of how were those different um i went i went for a little bit more larger dog yeah. i liked the thickness. I wanted a good thick dog. Um, and I also wanted a very, very up personality for showing. And okay. so a lot of these different things, mom and I always agreed on one thing, a headpiece. So that 
head, which is, I think, been pretty much established in the kennel name, um, continued. But other than a little bit, I went from maybe a little bit more fancier dog, not that I'm looking to give up anything, not that they shouldn't have the substance and the chest and the confirmation and the agility and the movement. But we just, we went for a little bit different look. So I wanted to breed my own look, even though it was the same kennel. And later on through the years, mom and I did, you know, lots of breedings together. And just for the edification of our younger audience, tell everyone who your mother was. Janet Bunce, and she is the founder of Wochika Golden Retrievers. And uh, mom passed away three years ago and was active with Golden Retrievers to right all the way through. And I am her second generation and it's so much a part of my blood, I could never think of giving it up. And you have you have a lit, you have two litters right now even I have two litters right now yes <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome I do, I do. it's um, um, I love I absolutely adore having puppies in the house I love it there's nothing better yes True. lots of things can totally. go wrong Yvonne um, what about oh sorry didn't mean to interrupt Dad I was like Yvonne what what about you you know um, yeah I just I think you know. Uh, it's, it's just a kind of a really neat question. And, and I will, don't forget the Linda's follow-up. <laughs> okay, with, um, with why I started breeding. Yeah. Okay, um, because I, um, I had already been in the obedience world with my giant schnauzer. He had seen the other goldens and I felt that Amber was, um, you know, uh, a, a wonderful dog, you know, with obedience. And um, I seen other males that I liked. And I, I just wanted to continue that, that performance background. And but did you breed to a performance male? I'm interested. I did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, with a pretty strong field background. And um, Amber's mother was out of a, a field dog also. So, because mm-hmm. I can remember when Amber was, um, as she was, you know, growing, and I thought she, she was little, you know, or, <laughs> or where's all the coat? And, you know, so, so I was learning more about the difference between a confirmation dog and, and, uh, more of a performance dog, which there should be, I believe that they should both be um, included and showing horses. I was, I knew confirmation was important. Um, My dogs would never be showing when they're 10 or 12 years old. Most of them have gone till they're 12 if they didn't have good structure. between when I'm campaigning a dog, you know, traveling all over the country, it's, it's uh, traveling, the showing. Um, now, most of our trials, we have a lot of uh, shows that are, you have two trials a day. And when you get home, you usually have something to fix or you're, you know, you, you're constantly working that dog. Um, uh, my dogs, uh, that I uh, work. I was at the chiropractor with three of them this morning. This, you know, not that they needed it, just to make sure, you know, there everything is good. And I said to the chiropractor, I said, I I need to go to the chiropractor. But um, <laughs> you know, but I'm, you know, I'm I make sure that they get there. Um, a few years ago, my husband gave me the choice of a swimming pool or a new kitchen. And I told him the next day I would like a swimming pool. He called me up later and he goes, I can't believe you want a swimming pool instead of um, a new kitchen. Well, um, I'll start swimming my dogs in about two weeks. <laughs> and I think they love it. You know, Absolutely. Not, they, you know, so it's keeping them in, in condition. Um, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and how much of this really, when we start that transition from 
owning to breeding, it, it is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And, and Rhonda, you, you said it really, uh, really well in the beginning about how you're hanging out with your friends. I mean, it's a lifestyle. We all join together and uh, we just start sharing and, and tell, tell us about how you made that transition a little. Uh, well, I, there was something in me that wanted to breed right from the beginning. And um, I, maybe it's a, sort of a creativity kind of thing because you sort of go into it thinking I can have this head that I want or, you know, whatever feature. And um, I, I just liked it right from the beginning. So even though I just started with my newspaper pet, Fortunately, she did obtain health clearances and yes. she <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. Oh, go ahead. You got something. Go for it, girl. We didn't, we didn't have a consequential dog from anyone unless ah. it was their first bitch, but just wanted to know. Okay. Um, I, I guess that would have to be um, Tambar. If something's burning, her call name was Coke. She was my dog of the year. And um, probably out of all of my dogs, probably the most intelligent one. Um, wow. She, I mean, she learned articles like uh, the second time I put the articles down. I mean, she just <laughs> learned extremely quick. But in the same sense, if. Um, she became bored. So when she was six years old, she was doing walk-ins on, on signals and things like that. And my husband said, you know, she's done a lot for you already. Maybe you should just, you know, quit. And I knew she had more. So I just changed my training style. She made me a better trainer is what she did. Um, and if I didn't hadn't done that, she would have never been, you know, dog of the year. And she did that. She was a few months shy of um, 11, I believe. Wow. She, I have a gate going from my kitchen into the rest of the house. I have people come to the house and they don't know how to open this gate. Well, I, the fourth gate is in their kitchen now because she could open it. She could <laughs> open it and maybe we would be outside and all the dogs would be roaming around in the rest of the house. That's so, great. Yeah. yeah. So she, I, there's a lot of stories I have of her. And that, that's awesome. We and and it's so fun to be able to 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 tell those and remember them and share them. And I mean, you, you get that once in a lifetime, you know, dog. Rhonda, did you, do you did you want to add one? Sure. Um, I. It really would have to be Thunder, um, who was champion Ferris Future Classic. And he started off with a bang at by going reserve dog at seven months old at the national. Mm -hmm. And um, I never specialed him. He finished quickly. I never specialed him. People started seeing his kids. <coughs> and um, that, that litter, actually, um, there were there were two males and a female. And uh, the numbers on their production, um, I didn't even realize this until recently. So Thunder produced 135 champions or major title dogs. Wow. His brother produced 60 and his sister produced um, 15. Wow. With, wow. The, with the sister, three of her pups were in the top 10 at the same time. And I don't think there's ever been three brothers in the top 10 at the same time. No. So that no. from those siblings, um, we have over 210 champions. Wow. And- <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, let me add something more if you don't mind. Um, or if it's better later, just in oh, a row. But, um, Thunder also changed my focus in breeding because I'd always been interested in health topics beyond the regular clearances and so forth. And he was diagnosed with lymphoma and I had just been to a health conference 
and I contacted some of the researchers to say, how can I help? You know, I want to make this better. And um, it was about the same time that the GRCA uh, GRF health survey came out, letting us know that about 60% of our dogs die from cancer. Yeah. And it really, it, it was almost like a mission for me to try to help researchers and put out calls for people participating in studies. And I'm, I am so happy that that's, I still showed and bred somewhat, but I am so happy at the attitude in GRCA changed from everybody being secretive about their health problems. And over the course of the 20 years that I've been doing this, I think people are much more open and researchers now pick golden retrievers as breeds to study because they know we'll help them. Absolutely. And we, we really right. have that reputation of of helping research. So that was a big change that Thunder made for me. Yeah, and, and with that, I mean, his impact made, made a huge difference on, on what you did. And, and one of the questions that we have on here is about, is basically about that, you know, um, who or what a person or a dog that kind of shaped your way of thinking about your breeding program and, and, and continues, like you just said, really in your work today, Rhonda influences you and Karen, is there a dog or a person, you know, for you that kind of, kind of shapes um, your breeding program today, or I know establishing could be another way to look at it or still impacts your decisions. Uh, that's so hard. I mean, uh, the, the kennel has sustained for so many years. Mm -hmm. Every brood bitch is influential. Every brood bitch is special because it's carrying on the line. So for me to be able to sit here now after being involved with a breeding program for over 50 years, it's because of every brood bitch or stud dog that contributed to the pedigree that I am working with today. Now, are there some absolute favorite dogs that shaped me? I mean, I could name everything from Cummings Gold Rush Charlie to, uh, you know, to True Bear, to coming into the dogs that were made such an impact showing them. Uh, Briarwood, my high flying legend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she was my favorite all time show dog and her and I were inseparable. And she is the great grandmother of both the litters I have right now. Wow. And, you know, it, this is, they all become important. I had a wonderful stud dog that had a beautiful pedigree. He was an outstanding sire. He was a Canadian champion, grand champion. Um, he was limited in a, as a stud dog. Um, certain breeders put their shot and took their shot on him. And I want to say, I believe in almost all, but maybe one of all the litters he produced, he produced specialty winners yeah. besides himself being a specialty winner. So maybe he didn't have a hundred breedings, but his limited breedings were of wonderful quality. That's um, awesome. Let me ask if I could, because you're already touching on that, um, which is essentially one of our next questions, which is about establishing a family of dogs. And I know mm -hmm. each of you have done that. And if you would just take a minute to explain what it means to establish that kind of depth for yeah. people who want to start breeding. Oh, that's a tough one too. I mean, it, you, you, first you have to start with a look and that look, it can't be all about your own ego. It has to, you have to get consensus from people who have been <laughs> successful in the breed and following the standard. 
Of course, everybody is going to pick their little variations of their preferences, but you want, you need to at least be able to conform to what everybody can recognize as a golden retriever to begin with. Yeah. From there, it's investing a lot of years. This is not a short term. I've been told this years ago. This is not a short term investment. It's a long term commitment. And yeah. each time you can produce, you have a healthy, if you're going to be a breeder, you've got a healthy brood bitch to start with. You start aiming for the consistency that from her first litter to maybe her fourth litter, you can see a consistency that's going to conform to the standard and yet still be to your liking. Mm. And, and with that in mind, Yvonne, and because you've just seen this, um, you know, with, with the multitude of title holders that you have, and especially with the characteristics and the drive um, that you're producing with performance dogs primarily, um, you know, kind of to piggyback on what Karen said, would you go back, um, you know, and breed back like um, to an older dog with whether you have frozen on that dog to reinvest in that family of dogs that you've established? Um, yes, I, I have uh, frozen semen on, um, on one of my males that I, I don't, I'm purchasing a puppy this, this summer mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, hopefully things, you know, health wise and everything work out that I can go back to that mail. Um, I have bitches uh, at home that are in eighth generation now from the first golden um, and so also knowing, um, in obedience for almost 40 years, the performance dogs and remembering the good and the, and the bad, you know, things, uh, about those dogs, you know, um, because it's just not, I want drive what, but I want, um, a dog with a good head on its shoulders, um, you know, confirmation. You Excuse me one second. Does that mean mentally or a beautiful head? Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. This is um, the kind of questions we get at the yes. end. That's why I'm asking. A, a stable dog, a, a biddable dog. You know, okay. you can have all the drive, and and um, and not have that a dog that's biddable. You know mm -hmm. that I have. Um, I bought a male. He'll be five this coming August. I looked almost three years for a certain pedigree and he's, I love this dog. Um, I mean, he sleeps next to me. He's, he has all the drive in the world, but he's able to control himself. He learns fast. Um, he, I like his structure. Um, and I'm, I'm actually having puppies out of him in, in about two and a half weeks. That'd be the first puppy. <laughs> That's exciting. That's exciting yeah. to be able to to bring bring somebody back like that to just reinstate that family of dogs that you know um, that you cared about so much. And and Rhonda, I want to make sure that you get a chance at this question as well. And I'm going to add a little bit uh, on it as far as that because we do get a lot of questions about breeding itself and going back to a dog um, to like re in, reinvest or reestablish um, in your group, you know, and whether it's frozen and, and um, I'll just kind of skip to this, but when you think about that and re in, in reinstating that dog back into those pedigrees, is there a certain method that you prefer to use when doing that? Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, was that Yvonne or for me? Uh, I was, I just, it, either one of you, but I'll start with you, Rhonda. Okay. Um, so the answer is complicated. <laughs> because right. I really don't breed or show very much. Okay. Uh, although I have a young bitch that I'm starting out right now, but um, I do go back to, to my frozen. I have frozen on 
uh, Thunder and Star, and I do go back to it. Mm -hmm. But partly the reason I go back to it is my comfort level with that line. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I'm not, I don't think any of my breeding will have any kind of impact on current show dogs I'm really not doing it that much and um, so because and the reason that's important to me now is all those stats that I told you about last time the 210 champions and all that crazy stuff um, at the time it it was the it was the kind of thing we did. We did lots of line breedings. We bred to popular sires. We, you know, did that kind of thing. Um, what we have found out as time passes is that's harmful to our breed. And in terms of, of health, um, that it sets the stage for some of the things that we, oh, another clearance, another DNA test, oh, you know, all this stuff that sets the stage because we're narrowing the gene pool. Yeah. And if I thought my own breeding was going to have an impact on anybody else, I wouldn't keep um, line breeding like that because my, my breedings are still line breedings. And I think the breeders of today would benefit to learn from my mistakes. I think many of the breeds mistakes in in creating popular sires uh -huh. and in um, a lot of line breeding. It is a good tool in the sense that many of us have shaped our breeding line through line breeding, but it's not in the best interest of the dogs. Well, I mean, you know, there we all we all know that there's a lot of different a lot of different ways to establish and, and the fact that we're able to go back to some of those dogs and bring them forward in a pedigree now is you know and have that technology is is really great and, and it, I, it is amazing yeah. and i i think some of the current breeders could go back to some of these frozen dogs right. and maybe get away from some of the new stuff <laughs> right and reestablish. Well, I'm, I'm about to to be using frozen um mm -hmm. but i have waited years to make sure that the pedigree was far enough away before I bring them back again. So again, that's not a short-term plan. It's another right. thing that, that takes time. I have to be able to breed away, breed away, breed away before I'm going to bring this dog back again. So, uh, and I think it is, I think the, there were, many stable good dogs in our past that contributed a lot and would be just as competitive today as they were back then. So, but I think you, you need to be careful about how close you're bringing it back into. They, I do believe, I, I think there are a lot of breeders out there that make a mistake by continually breeding to their own dogs. Right. And I, all through the years, because of constrictions that I had in the amount of dogs I had, I really only had one stud dog on the premises. So a lot of my brood bitches, I went out and sought other stud dogs that suited my purpose, a look I liked, a show dog, um, something that I thought gelled nicely with my pedigree to keep a consistent look going. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I only kept really one stud dog on the premises. So I certainly kept daughters out of him to keep him going. But I also would kind of like do a zigzag kind of with my pedigree, stay in, go out, stay in, go out, just so that I wouldn't get trapped into consistently only my own dogs. Yes, right. I, I was going to ask you if you ever considered a top dog, because it sounds like you're very considered about what dogs you went out to with your bitches. Mm -hmm. um, did you use top dogs or top winning dogs or, um, or did you specifically look for a sire 
more than a top winning dog? I was looking for a sire because okay. sometimes, you know, there certainly when you have been in this long enough, every kennel does have a look going for it. Now, there all of a sudden may be a top dog that comes out with the right combination to make him a top dog. But is he going to throw his whole kennel line that I may not like? Or was he just the oddball of that pedigree that was able to make it in the show ring? So I look more for a, a look that I think is going to be compatible with the pedigree that I have going on here. So yeah. if it happens to be a top show dog, okay. Um, but that's not what drives me to that dog in the first place. I want to, I need to like his parents. I need to like a couple of his siblings before I'm going to be convinced about that dog. Absolutely. And I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears just a minute here to talk about uh, something that we get a lot of questions about. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Rhonda, and these are going to kind of be very targeted to each of you ladies. So you've been warned um, uh, ahead of time, but um Rhonda, can you comment on the titer testing to de determine immunity and what vaccines are needed for adult dogs? And I'll, I, I want you to, your comment, obviously, but in your opinion, has the science proven that vaccines um, lead to all cancers in dogs or just cancer? Um, so I am- I did a total 180 person. on you, sorry. You know, but. So there is no evidence in dogs that vaccinations play any role in development of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, you can, I, you, we often hear about over vaccinating, giving four, five, eight vaccinations all at once is a drop in the bucket to what that dog will be exposed to that day. So um, it, it's, there is no known health risk really with vaccinating dogs when the um, recommendations for those vac vaccination schedules are. Um, there are a number of vaccinations that we give that have shown to last longer than three years and they're only licensed for three years. And if an owner would want to um, do their first adult booster sometime at 14 months, 18 months, and then skip six or seven years of vaccinating, that would probably make sense just because they don't need it. But if somebody vaccinates that dog, it's not going to harm that dog. But then they really should be picking up. And when the dog starts to getting a, an older immune system, they really re need to restart those more frequent vaccinations. I have a quick question, Rhonda, following that up. <laughs> For those who don't have a lot of access to titering, but are interested, are there places they can research what is believed to be the um, one of the measuring devices of a titer? Like what means they are going to be protected? Well, I guess the first question I would ask is why do you do a titer? Because mm -hmm. um, titers measure antibodies in the blood and antibodies go up after a vaccination and they hang around for a while and eventually they won't be measured by the titer any longer. But long-term immunity is maintained in memory T cells and getting a negative titer on your dog does not mean that dog is not protected. You really aren't giving yourself any usable information by titering. So um, I, I, it's useful, for example, in breeds that don't develop good immunity and they want to vaccinate the dog and then titer test a month later and see if they had an immune response or if they need another vaccination. Mm -hmm. But that just isn't golden. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for the insight. I mean, um, we kind of had a, a, a preliminary discussion about that before we started and I just, I just learned a lot in that one statement. So thank you so much. Uh, it's very valuable, very valuable information. 
Yvonne, I'm going to put you in the hot seat for a minute. Not Thank really. You. You've got a very comfortable <laughs> chair, it looks like. So um, do you think that obedience people um, know that golden, the golden standard and they're committing to getting dogs that um, are sound and meet the standard or uh, are they looking for other things that are more important to them? And I don't mean that as a cut at all. Like I kind of, I mean, it's a question that came to us. I didn't just think of that, but I, I know that when we were talking about type, when we're talking about things, uh, you know, Karen mentioned it earlier about um, the look that people want, you know, we, we do see, frankly, we do see dogs uh, in different areas, whether it's field, performance, show, even specialty dogs, I know I'll, I'll say it, that are very different in their look. And, and so I'll, I'll pose the question to you as, you know, our over 100 Ochbred dogs, um, you know, as far as in your, in your opinion. Um, I, I know they do not look like the confirmation dogs. Um, I, I was, in fact, I just, I also got a new puppy that is out of a champion master hunter, um, a female puppy. And um, because I would like to walk in the ring with a dog that looked like our confirmation dogs. And um, she's about 13, 14 weeks old and uh, we're really enjoying her and she learns quickly. Um, I do not, I mean, I'm not all that happy that my dogs are, you know, look so different. Um, but th there's definitely a difference. Uh, I mean, uh, some of them are, um, are uh, they're small. Um, they're, they're field dogs. And, and not to, and not, let me just reiterate and not, and not to say that one is less as far as the other, as far as their ability to do their jobs at all. I think that, I think one thing that a lot of confirmation people do is they have this serious look and they can learn a lot from the other dogs. And, and the phrase overdone comes to mind when you see in the, in the confirmation ring, you have a dog that has a lot of bone. There's no way that dog is is going to be doing obedience because it would be a health risk possibly or going to be swimming all day so i think in in the middle of it i, I don't want it to come across as saying it's so different why but saying that there's a, a a meeting of the minds from both sides of it so yeah i mean you know it's there there is a, a definite difference and even my short-coated dogs uh, if they, if they're in the brush, I mean, even those with, you know, not a lot of coat, I'm picking little burrs or those little, you know, um, so imagine, you know, a, a long haired dog going into, to that. Um, and I mean, uh, I just had my, the puppy groomed today for the first time. And I mean, she's as cute as can be. So I'm looking forward to showing her and, and, um, and in the same respect, when I sell puppies, you know, people may see me in a ring with a, you know, um, a, I mean, a, a dog that's a, a lot of dog and they are not for, for everyone. And I try and match people up with um, the correct puppies when I sell puppies. Um, but there is, Unfortunately, there's a difference. There is a definite difference. And yeah. it would be nice to get back to the middle. Right, right. Karen, we had we had a question come in as kind of a follow-up to what we said before and and um and and briefly, because I know you kind of hit on it throughout your explanation of of what we talked about a little bit, but uh, one of the follow-ups on that that we got on our lab chat was why is line breeding um not in the best interest of the dogs, do you think? Or, or is it more in the best interest of the dogs? And, and then they kind of followed up that follow-up, just so you know, with um, uh, talking kind of about um, choosing a dog to, br to breed in your, to bring into your program. And when you have a dog that has all the testing proved and, and the clearances and stuff like that, are there, um, 
Are there titles that you feel are a little bit more um, outstanding to have to join your pedigree versus versus others? Um, this person particularly does a lot of obedience and rally and and possibly wants more dogs with confirmation just as a follow up. OK, um, well, and I would like to go into a little bit about the fact of I fully believe that the golden should be an all around dog. It should be able to do obedience, confirmation and field. It's the degree that you're talking about. Now, if you are going, if you are a field person and you want to go for those master hunters, then obviously less coat, maybe a little less bone is going to be more beneficial to you. An obedience dog, I still want a golden retriever, whether it's a show dog or a field dog or obedience dog to have enough agility to be agile enough to be able to get an obedience degree. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean it can be an arch dog? I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll ask Yvonne. We'll ask Yvonne. If, well, I'm gonna, okay. miss, uh, I'm gonna okay. give her a video of my dogs and say, "Can this be an arch dog?" Correct. <laughs> I believe that it should be a well-rounded dog to be able to do all of it. Yeah. So, if the coat's gonna get ripped up when you put it in the field, well, then you don't show it, and when you're ready to show it, you start conditioning it again to get the coat back in again. Um, to go on to the line breeding. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely did have and still do health issues. And I think the more that you double up on certain issues, mm -hmm. which is getting a close, closer and closer pedigree, mm -hmm. you've got more mm -hmm. chance of these coming out. So I don't mind leaving my pedigree into going into another pedigree to maybe not be doubling up on health issues. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that I want to change my look. There are other lines out there that's, that carry many of the same traits that I enjoy in my dogs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would try to put together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate that. And we've had a lot of people just chime in during the explanation to say thanks for, for that follow-up. Um, Guys, we got a lot of questions, so I might just kind of rapid fire some of these. Um, no doubt, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh, Linda's like, we got it. We got so many things coming in. <laughs> but um, just kind of, and, and I'll let I'll let whoever wants to take this one kind of I'll put it out into the floor, so to speak. But um, you know, uh, one of the questions is, uh, if you're still breeding, you know, what are some issues that you are currently addressing in your in your breeding programs? And if you're not currently breeding, what issues do you think need to be addressed? Anybody want to take that one on? Or you guys are all like, pass. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'll say I want to completely concentrate on temperament. Okay. They, you know what? I know we are a show forum. And, uh, you know, everything that we're talking about tonight, but I'm going to tell you 90% of my goldens are so, so pet homes with two children and families and people that love the golden retriever. They've had them before they've lost it. They can't live without another one. Yeah. My number one thing is temperament big time. Sure. Um, I think we have way too many hyper goldens. And I won't live with one. They need to be calm. They need to lay by my feet, not keep <laughs> bothering me every five seconds. I've got a lot of things to get done in a day. Yeah. Um, I And now <laughs> we are bringing dog parks in and doggy daycares. We have got to have good temperaments on these dogs if we want to keep promoting them as the number one family dog. Yeah. Right. Rhonda, what do you think? Um, I think it's really, really hard for breeders today because they can't do what we could do 50 years ago. And what we could do 50 years ago is be comfortable getting, oh, all we had was hips and eyes in 1970. Um, and we could eliminate health problems that we knew of because there were a lot of good dogs that, that did clear hips and eyes. And 
we didn't have to prioritize health or temperament or type or but breeders now i think they need to start prioritizing um the issues because there are some we can't afford to narrow our gene pool any longer yeah and there are some silly things that people don't want to breed to for example missing teeth missing teeth nature is trying to get rid of the teeth because the jaws are smaller than the wolf we're fighting mother nature and it doesn't hurt the dog um yeah. so i think people today need to prioritize their health concerns and show concerns and everything and don't be afraid to breed to something that is not perfect. We used to think we could breed perfect dogs and now we know we can't. We have to accept imperfections. I think a lot of geneticists will say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of a situation. And Yvonne, one for you, um, you know, kind of on that, on that lines of, of breeding, um, would you incorporate a dog into your breeding program that you know would be or would produce some unfinishable offspring to improve your program? And then there's another question, of course, because these guys are good. Okay. Um, would you give, um, would you give um, up winning for a more correct golden, a healthier golden, if it was necessary? Um, that's just why I bought this, this puppy recently. Uh, I mean, there are five, in, um, five champion master hunters in that litter um, that uh, her, from her sire. So definitely. And the health and temperament. Um, and even though I do have field dogs, I'm not looking for crazed field dogs. You know, I'm looking for dogs that, just like she said, you know, are able to lay down by you or, or and not, you know, pester you. But at the same moment, I'm able to pull them out of the crate when I'm um, maybe going in for a runoff and that dog is ready to go. Right. Um, so, yes, I, I'm excited about this puppy that I just um, came into our home. That's, that's great. Rhonda, I got a follow-up one for you. And I'm going to, I'm going to, this because you kind of answered this question and, uh, and also um, is someone asked, do you think with your, with your uh, statement about teeth that it still should be a DQ? Well, it's not a DQ. Um, <laughs> right, okay. well, or or unfair <laughs> thing. Yes. But, but what happens is, and I've seen this time and time again, mm -hmm. people don't want to breed to stud dogs that have imperfections. Right. Whether it's missing teeth or a lighter color nose or they they don't want that. And so breeders keep making the choice not to breed to those stud dogs. And it really diminishes. Uh, the genetic diversity in the breed to yeah. only accept perfection. Yeah, absolutely. So. Karen, there was a there was a survey that was done, and and um, there were a surprising number. Uh, we have been surprised, I guess, at the number of breeders and judges at the um, who rate gate as one of the top three or five most important traits in a golden. And this was a survey that. Uh, a lot of people who are on this um, web webinar got um, in, as a judge or a handler or a breeder, um, and that was one of the, the the three or five most top things was this gate, and even thought to um, it says that um, a golden he was even thought that does not take part in um, you know to not have a great gate basically was very less less of a dog, and as a handler and a breeder. What parts of the standard are least likely to be appreciated, you think, by judges? And has that changed over time? And, and how have you dealt with this? Well, I, I have a hard time with what I think people that don't know type. And uh, I- <laughs> Thank you. To me, to me, 
you know, <laughs> you should be able to forgive a rear that maybe is slightly cowhocked or um, movement that isn't not necessarily perfect. To me, a type, you, uh, type is still up way up there. Movement comes a close second. Mm -hmm. I do believe that uh, a balanced, I'm looking for a balanced golden retriever, one that knows how to use its body, because I do believe that that is part of what the golden function is. It was supposed to be able to work in the field. It is to be able, supposed to work in obedience. And to do that, they have to know how to use their body. And that to me is what movement's about. It's not about whether it's a little bit wide in the front or it's a little bit cowhocked in the rear. It's how that dog uses its body to mm -hmm. get around. And yeah. to me, that should be light on their feet. It should have a nice springy balanced truck mm -hmm. going on that they can carry their bodies um so yes it, it it's an important part for me yeah I, I, absolutely and and like i said i know some of these questions can be a little hard to answer but they're really they're really great yvonne you've you've got one imagine that um have you seen <laughs> um a change in the drive and biddability of goldens um you started with um to the dogs that you see in obedience now yes um I would say that I believe that it's pretty much the same. It's a, a mixture mm -hmm. of um, of the correct dog and in the performance dog. I would say that, um, but uh, there would be, um, well, I guess it's not even. It, it's more, you know, more your smaller dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those dogs that are showing weekend after weekend and the training in between. Um, I have a lot of dogs doing um, agility and um, a lot of those dogs are showing up until they're 10 years old or, or more. Um, and it's, you know, I, I have jump mats in front of my jumps just to save on the you know, on, on their feet, when they, they, they land on their front feet. Um, conditioning is important. There's, um, I've got one of my dogs doing water treadmill. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> dogs are, they're not spoiled. <laughs> um, Whatever. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's all uh, right. There is a difference. Yeah. Absolutely. Rhonda, this one came in for you. Uh, do you think the lifespan of a dog correlates to the lifespan of their offspring? Um, no, it's, uh, it's been pretty definitively shown that lifespan um, is most closely genetically rated, uh, related to height and body mass. And if our breed has a specific height and body mass that predicts a lifespan of 10 to 12 years. We are at 10 to 12 years. Um, the, the only way to really breed um, longer lived dogs is to breed different dogs that are shorter and narrower. And it could be done if people wanted to do it, but it wouldn't be a golden retriever. And no breed has ever successfully broken the connection between uh, height, body mass, and longevity. So mm. studying pedigrees, breeding um, for longevity doesn't work. So as a follow-up thing, talking about longevity a little bit, uh, uh, someone wrote in, um, we know that cancer is an extremely complicated medical condition, but how often do you study the prevalence of cancer in potential lines before you would breed to that dog? I don't, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, 
Well, you know, I really am all about health of our dogs, but I don't waste my time on things that don't matter. The, the genetic predisposition in golden retrievers was most likely um, came from the founder dogs. It is widely dissipated across countries and, and within the US and overseas. And whether a dog gets cancer and dies at seven, or a dog does not get cancer and lives to 14, is whether that dog was lucky or unlucky. It tells you nothing about their offspring. Gotcha. Okay. The, the good information. I uh, I have a late Sherry asks. This is from Sherry. Since the 70s, when she started in dogs, there's been a large swing from natural deliveries to C-sections. So we're taking it a different, a different way here. We're talking about the, the end result of all this breeding. Um, and uh, can, you can you comment on that? Do you think it's better for the dogs or more convenient for owners? Or what do you think, what do you think drives that, Karen? I think it's a combination of all of that. I think it is convenient for a lot of owners. We've got a lot of people, the breeders of yesteryear and the breeders of today are quite different. The, the old pioneers, they were people who knew farm life, farm animals, um, that kind of a thing. So breeding dogs was not any major, you know, problem as far as it's, it's the natural way of, of nature. Mm -hmm. The strong are going to live, the weak may die. Um, you do what you can, you're obviously going to be there to oversee. But then we've got a bunch of people today who can't deal with delivery. So right. C-section yes. is the way to go. What's healthier for the dog? Um, not necessarily a vet. So I'm, I couldn't necessarily answer that, but yeah. I will say that at any cost, I try to avoid a C-section. I've made many a trip to the emergency vet at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and my words to them are do whatever you can get do, but try to avoid that C-section. So maybe it is getting out one dead puppy so the rest can be born alive. Um, how constant c-sections affect the uterus affect the the female scar tissue this that i'm not exactly sure um but i'm very old school and it's it's natural pretty much for me mm -hmm. uh, and i'm still a big believer in a real stud dog i don't if i can avoid it i don't do artificials right. i'm very willing to use my stud dog uh, teach them how to be good stud dogs, which all of mine have been. I've enjoyed that. Where I don't <laughs> have to keep running to the vet to uh, get a breeding on a dog. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Can I ask Yvonne a question? Yeah, sure. sure. So typically when I talk to people about natural well-being c-sections just try to help guide them in their decisions a general rule of thumb and these are confirmation people a general rule of thumb that i use is that most golden bitches can whelp seven puppies with no problem eight to ten you can plan on losing one mm -hmm. ten to twelve you can plan on losing two and twelve plus you can plan on you losing three. Is that different in obedience lines where the dogs are much more fit or uh, uh, working lines where the dogs are, they, they're not the uh, bulky dogs that we have in confirmation and they're probably not, um, they're more fit. So is that different among your breedings? I would say that um... When I had natural breedings, um, I did not uh, lose many puppies. I was, I, I was thinking back and how fortunate I've been. Um, I had a natural uh, whelping 
in December. Um, I called my vet and ran the, uh, it was, she was in labor, but it, nothing was happening. And so mm -hmm. she actually had to pull the first puppy out. The first puppy was alive. It was a big male. The next puppy was a big female and she was gone. Um, let me see, I, I ended up with six puppies and, and I lost three. Um, hmm. I took her home when she had five puppies and uh, I took her in the next morning and there was still one big puppy left and that puppy was mm -hmm. gone also. Um, I have had C-sections uh, with frozen semen with uh, dogs that had you know passed on or had been gone for quite some time. Uh, <clears throat> two years ago from a dog that I bred uh, I didn't own him, but um, the owner wanted a puppy out of him, and the semen was, I think, about 20 years old. So we did um, a surgical implant, and that was a C-section. I have uh, the I have a litter due May 15th. Um, that was a natural breeding. We did an ultrasound. Okay. The backstory on this this female is she had an open pyometria in the fall. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the reproduction specialist um, late on a Friday night, um, my doctor wasn't in. I seen someone I didn't know. And she said, you know, you really should spay this female. So I set up an appointment to go back down to Illinois on Monday mm -hmm. morning and um, I mean, I never knew she was sick. I was training her and I have uh, corner mirrors in my building. And I thought, what in the world's hanging off of your butt? Well, it was pus. So, oh, no. yeah. No. So um, my husband said Sunday, she was running around like everything's all fine and hunky dory. And he says, are you sure you want to spay her? And I said, well, not really. So I went back on Monday morning. I seen the specialist and she says, well, we can get her through this and we can try to breed her the next time. So that is what we did. We, we got her through that. And um, I drove down to Illinois five days in a row for yeah. um, they could keep an eye on her. And mm -hmm. Uh, the next time she, well, this was a surgical implant, I mean, a natural breeding this time, but we're having a C-section on May 15th. Yeah. Um, so not, I, not the way that I want, really like to do that, but um, she, she's my next generation. Those puppies are my next generation. So yeah. I want to get them here. Yeah, you're just trying to ensure the the what you've already you know invested in and established. Absolutely, yeah. Ron, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears for a second, and um, we got a, a a question in that is kind of a very you know different than kind of what we're talking about, but kind of it's definitely for you. They said for Rhonda. So given given what you said about we have no control over the lifespan of our dogs from the breeding perspective. What are some environmental things we can do to help our Goldens to avoid cancer as much as possible? Like we know about some flea and tick prevention that we can, that can, we can help avoid in some types of cancers, but what can we do? Is there anything you feel we can do even nutrition or, or diet wise? Um, I don't think the answer is in nutrition. Um, um, we aren't showing that in any of the research. You did hit on flea and tick protection. Um, it, there's a connection. Um, in Goldens, we've known this for 15 years, that Goldens um, who have adequate flea and tick protection have less lymphoma, um, quite a bit less, and a little bit less hemangial sarcoma. Okay. Um, but another thing I'll throw out there, your vets are all going to not want you to do this. <laughs> but we just and, went up to like over 200 people on the webinar and I'm just joking. But, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, many, many years ago, when we were first 
starting to look at when GRF first came to us with a million dollars to spend and how, what should we spend this on? And there, this came up at a cancer conference I was attending and we sat around just tossing out ideas. And one of the ideas eventually became the Golden Lifetime Study, but not right then because the price that we got on trying to do what we wanted to do was $2.4 million and GRF could not do that. Right. Um, but the one with 10 cancer researchers or oncologists asked, what would you want to test? Nine of the 10 said aspirin. Huh? Aspirin? And aspirin, because in humans, aspirin significantly reduces many kinds of cancer. Mm -hmm. In people who take it for heart disease, they're finding that it's reducing their cancer rate. Inflammation at the level of blood vessels drives most of our chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. And we don't have the data in dogs, but I will tell you all of my dogs get a chewable baby aspirin in their food every morning. Mm. Um, there's really not a lot beyond that that we, we think might work, but of course it's always under investigation. Yeah, I actually have a question, uh, and this is wondering about my own dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. So many new products are coming out that is a once a month, supposedly cure or all, it's going to take care of everything that they want us to ingest. Now, is that a safer route to go than using any topicals? Like if we're talking flea and ticks, where uh, I don't, I'm not in a heavy tick infested area. And for me, the seasons here on the East Coast, we maybe have maybe three months where we're going to see more of a problem with this. I feel a little bit more comfortable going with the topical stuff as opposed to all these new once a month things that they want our dogs to ingest? Well, the, the oral products, um, the way they kill fleas and ticks and are, they go through um, two different kinds of pathways. One is that they affect um, the exoskeleton, the, sh the shells of fleas and ticks, and dogs and humans don't have that pathway in our biology, so it does not affect us. And the other way is they can um, go through a, an insect um, arthropod um, nervous system uh, pathway. And we also have a different kind of nervous system. So I think the chances are probably very good that the orals are very safe. And, um, you know, I, I think that would be a question between you and your vet. Mm -hmm. Jenny, we ought to probably get to those two questions. Um, yeah, I, I know those two questions. questions. I think you mean the 22. <laughs> Right. <laughs> not the ones that are coming over the the thing but the ones we sent to our panelists ahead of time um, yeah like the guy from indonesia yeah absolutely um uh, you know um so yeah this show to everybody who's been on with us thank you so much for for hanging in there we've fluctuated from anywhere from 120 to 175 people just on this zoom uh, so thank you so much. And the questions are amazing. And I love how you guys are asking each other questions. You guys, this is awesome. But we're we're worldwide with these things. So like, like Rhonda said before, you can't hide anywhere, you guys. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, uh, you know, this question comes to us from Indonesia. And um, 
you know, it says they are golden retriever enthusiasts and uh, says, I want to learn more about it. So my question is, aside from good bloodlines, good sires and dams, title parents, well breeding, feeding and environment. If I want a show quality puppy from, and I want a show quality puppy from a breeder, how to know if the puppy um, that, how to know the puppy that the breeder gives me is really a show quality puppy. And it goes on to say, I mean, what to look for at the ages of anywhere from two to three months. How do I know that the head will turn out like the parents or the leg or more? Um, and uh, just says, thank you for answering my question. So I'll, I'll put it out there if anybody wants to jump in. Okay, go. <laughs> yeah, not all at one time. <laughs> well, you know, getting a, uh, I think people have a preconceived notion. First of all, if you're interested in a show puppy from me, you're going to have to prove to me that this is a, you're serious about this commitment which means that you need to go to shows even before you get a dog. You need to learn about the shows. You need to start understanding what the commitment is to getting a show dog. The second thing is we all know that Goldens are once again on the rise. Every breeder that I know has got long waiting lists. There doesn't seem to be enough puppies out there. So um, if you can prove to the breeder that you're going to be serious about this, that you are going to use them as a mentor, if you people get along, anybody that wants to show, they have to stay in touch with me about training, about grooming, about health issues, about clearances. Um, and then the other thing is there's always going to be more than one good puppy in a litter. I know everybody wants, well, I have to have the pick. I want pick female. I want pick male. Well, you know, most of the time as a breeder, I keep from most of my litters and you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep my pick first, whichever one that I am drawn towards. That doesn't mean that there isn't other good puppies in the litter. Yeah. So a lot of it is it has to be the education of the people who are looking for that show dog. You just can't walk up to a breeder and say, oh, yeah, I want a show dog without proving that you're learning, that you've gone to seminars, that you've talked to several breeders, that you've gone to dog shows to find out what it entails. That to me would be a start. A absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we also had another question that we sent out to you guys, and um, and and thanks, Karen, for for taking that on. Kenzie asked, she's a 23 year old who just started is starting out, and she works as a licensed veterinary technician. And um, she says, I, I have finally have the means and the space to start my own small breeding program. She's struggling. She said, I've contacted a lot of show breeders. Uh, gone to lots of confirmation, ability, uh, agility, fly ball, rally, et cetera, to watch and learn. And I keep hitting a wall. Show breeders don't want to sell on full registration to someone who hasn't shown before, like you were saying, Karen, about, you know, kind of establishing some relationship. She understands, but she's not sure how to get started. And she keeps hitting this wall. And if she were to have a few mentors who were to help her and answer questions, you know, she feels like she could be helped. Uh, she really wants to start, but she can't seem to find her way in. What's your advice? And I'll let you all answer this question, please, uh, to someone who's trying to start out. And she says, thank you so much for taking her question. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to start out with, Yvonne? Um, I sell most of my puppies on uh, limited registration. Um, if, if someone was referred to me, and they were um, they were committed to training the dog and and showing it. Um, I would possibly uh, start with a co ownership. I do not do. I don't have any co ownerships now, but I have in the past because we all have to get started some was you know somewhere. But I have also had bad experiences. And so that's why my pups are on uh, limited registration. And, and like I said, if uh, most of my puppies sold are repeat customers and referrals. Um, 
it's, I know it's hard. And, and there, are, there are people looking for Goldens. Um, I never have had so many uh, requests for puppies. Um, but AKC has given us that way of protecting our dogs. So you would feel more comfortable selling to someone getting started if they had a referral? A referral, okay. yes. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Rhonda? I know you're not as actively breeding as the other two, but uh, in the past, or, or what would you be most comfortable with helping someone get someone started? Well, I do think you have to form relationships and um, join your local Golden Club. Um, again, as I think, as Karen said, you have to go to shows and meet people, um, even offer to help a person. Oh, are you going to this show? Um, can I come along if I help you set up an ex dogs? <laughs> and would you um, let me watch you groom? And, you know, things like that. Be helpful to the person, and they're going to know you and build a relationship. And, and that's how you get a puppy from a good breeder, I think. But you also probably do have to start off with a limit. Limits can be lifted once the clearances are achieved. And um, so let me ask you a question for somebody like this young woman, if she wants a puppy to show, so she can show in sweepstakes, but we sell to her on a limited registration, then that's not possible. So would you address the um, question about co-ownership? Um, is, is that a possibility for you so that a person could show um, as a puppy with a puppy? I, I've done that in the past. Um, yeah. I. I it, it, starting off breeders are going to be more flexible mainly because they are also looking for show homes. Right. So you might be sort of a novice handler or a novice show person, and you might get a puppy from sort of a novice breeder. <laughs> and, you know, but those dogs eventually, I mean, breeders we're all starting somewhere. You're starting the show, they're starting the breed. Yeah. And so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, and I know Karen, you kind of hit on this before about, you know, talking about establishing relationship, but is there anything you want to add? Uh, it's, I mean, again, personally myself, someone does, is the bigger, if they're interested in starting show, they're going to have to prove themselves to me. They're going to have to keep in contact. Um, anybody who's looking to buy a puppy from me, I tell them, bug me, hound me. I don't, if maybe I'll pick up the phone, maybe I won't, maybe I'll get back to you. But it, you also, they have to take some responsibility. They have to be starting to zero in on a certain kind of look. And the only way they're going to find that out is by showing up at shows. Mm -hmm. seek out where the local shows are in your area start going if you see someone walking around with a pretty golden ask them did they breed it did they buy it where did they buy it from if you bred it are you into are you having any more litters down the road right um, these are all things to start preliminary if you're really going to be a committed person Nobody want nobody. I mean, it's happened to all of us where somebody walks in the door and says, yeah, I want to show dog. I want to right. show this dog. And you give them a really, really nice puppy and they go to maybe two shows and then they decide now nah, we're too busy for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, some the, the someone who is this young woman who's looking to break into this. Um, she needs to decide on a breeder and hound them. Hmm. There you go. Well, Good I mean, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got we've got some amazing mentors right here, obviously, and we have learned so much in this very. I can't believe the time's just flown by with you guys. We've we've definitely gone over the allotted amount of time that we planned on having, but it was it was great. It was really great. I know. Before we close out, 
Um, we've got some announcements, but um, again, I, and we can't thank you enough for your time this evening, um, for your knowledge, for sharing that. Um, and with the hundreds of people that have that have logged on with us. And thank you so much for all the questions. Um, before Linda gets to some announcements, I will just say I have been copying down your questions that have not been answered. I will share them with the committee. So you guys will make sure that you, you get your questions answered. Um, and then I'll send those to the Breeders Education Committee. So don't despair. We've got so many good questions. I have a huge list, um, but I know my co-host, thank you so much, Linda, for being here. Oh, me. I don't know. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh, no, I, no, it's I great. Know. And I have some announcements. And I also want to make sure that I've gotten a lot of um, comments on, yes, you can see Kathy Turner on this webinar and she has been our silent partner in this, but she has something to say that'll be important. So don't worry. She's been very quiet, but she will come on and, and tell us some things. So Linda, I'll let you get some announcements out of the way. Okay. Wait, can, I, is, can I, um, I got some puppies to go feed. Um, is it okay if I can take off now? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Absolutely. And thank, thank you for so much. Karen. And I want to thank you for having me. I enjoyed every minute of it. Hey, it Karen, great. I want to tell you one quick thing. Um, I have frozen semen on a puppy or a dog sired by Jake from 1975. Oh, my goodness. goodness. <laughs> Ouch. Well, let me know when you use it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Hey, it was good seeing you all. Linda, you look wonderful. Oh, so well, I thank you. You're doing good. And yes, thanks you guys. guys again. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Karen. Linda, tell us those, those announcements real quick. Okay, just a couple. When you already went over one of them, and that is that if anybody sent a question, we will get those questions to each of the panelists, and we will probably have a small meeting amongst ourselves and discuss those questions, and then those will be posted. Uh, on Facebook, I believe, Jenny. Um, and then the other is very, very exciting news for our very next webinar. We have uh, had Wendy Townsend agree to be on our webinar, totally just her for the whole webinar. It will be co-hosted by Ann Hubbs, who is our chairman of Health and Genetics Committee. And put this date on your calendar for May 25th, it's our normal Tuesday, and it'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So that's it. And um, thank you all for being here. We hope you learned a lot. Absolutely. Kathy, take it away, my, our silent partner. I just want to thank everybody for doing this. I want to thank everybody who's attended. Um, starting with the um, pigmentary uveitis webinar, we will not only be live on Facebook, but thanks to uh, Jenny's research, we will also be live on YouTube so we can reach out to more people. Um, this, has been, this has been fabulous. I've been silent here and just having the best time listening to all you guys <laughs> and loving the interplay between Jenny and Linda. So thank you oh, very, <laughs> very much. It has, been, it has been fabulous. And I'm just over the moon as all, my, all the committee members are that Wendy Townsend has agreed to do this for Golden Retrievers. So it's gonna go up next week. Please get your questions in right away for Wendy because she wants to be able to uh, prepare slides that will address some of the questions. So um, uh, we wanna do more of that ahead. So she has a, a chance to, um, to um, tell us what we need to do. I can't think of anything right now in our breed that is more important than pigmentary uveitis. Um.